there, and welcome to the Game Dev Cafe. This is Karina, and welcome to another 2018 broadcast of Get to Know a Game Dev. Today, I'm very excited to talk with Becca Saltzman, uh, the co-founder of Finji.co. If you are not familiar with Finji, uh, we will certainly take a look at all of their games today, but they're probably best known for a couple titles, uh, little ones, um, such as Tunic, Overlord, or sorry, Overland, uh, Feist, Night in the Woods, um, a few more. Um, Becca, thanks for joining me today. I'm going to uh, pull you up on our actual display screen now, just so you know that you're, you're live and everybody can see you. Uh, but thanks for joining us. How's it going? It's going very well. Awesome. Um, are you freezing over there, wherever you are today? We're calling from Toronto, so it's always like the first question we ask in January. <laughs> uh, weirdly, no. So we're in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and we did have like the super, super cold temps, but um, it's supposed to be like 37 Fahrenheit today, and tomorrow's Ooh. supposed to be in the 40s, and it's supposed to be 50-something on Thursday. Okay, that's super Not that I'm going to be here, but... <laughs> I'm going to be in San Antonio. This is be hot and beautiful, but gorgeous. I mean, stuck in a convention center, but whatever. <laughs> well, Pack South is upon us, so um, so be it. <laughs> it's actually weirdly warm just today in Toronto as well, so I, I'm going to sort of credit that to our interview, and we'll go from there. <laughs> um, but yes, thanks again for joining us. Um, this is sort of a, a maybe out of character game dev uh, interview, since you're not strictly a game dev, um, not in the purest sense of the word. Um, but as I talked to you um, a little bit earlier about, I, I am really curious in getting to know people who um, are absolutely involved in game development, but maybe from a, a, a fringe position or a place of sort of logistical management that most people aren't familiar with. And I definitely think you fall into that category. Um, I guess to start with, if you maybe want to let us know um, what it is that, that Finji does, because that is the company that you founded with uh, your husband, um, and I guess sort of what your, your role is, or title, if, if you can even put your finger on one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so we run a small independent development studio called Finji, and we're not a Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the company is basically just me and Adam. Um, however, we do run an internal development team, so we're working with a really amazing artist, Heather Penn, out on... Um, out in Pasadena. Our audio director is actually in Austin, Texas, and our current animator is actually in Australia. Oh, cool. um, and we are building Overland. Um, Adam currently is lead program and lead designer on it. And I actually do do design work on oh, Overland. Awesome. Um, and my butt is not in the seat programming anything, <laughs> but um, I, do, I do do a lot of design work and um, sort of testing and working with UI and stuff. Um, but we also run a very super weird micro publisher. So Night in the Woods is one of our publishing projects along with Feist and Panoramical and Tunic is our next publishing project. Um, and a lot of these are more, like publishing is kind of a weird term for us because we do something that's more along the lines of collaborative development. Um, so we do do all the publishing stuff. We provide a company, we use my contacts with all the consoles, like the normal stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but we also like, Right now, Adam and Andrew on Tunic are actually doing a lot of design work together, um, sort of taking all the possibilities in in Andrew's like Tunic space and narrowing them down to find out like what is the most Tunicy decision. Oh. And Adam sort of helps poke Andrew kind of in the right direction. Cool. Uh, but our collaborative work with Night in the Woods was a lot different. Adam actually popped in as like a pinch artist later on in the project. He was the lead um, designer on Demon Tower, that game within a game. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it was different on Feist, it was different on Panoramical. Panoramical is actually mostly me. I was hurting all the cats oh. <laughs> towards release because there were a lot of people on that project. Um, so yeah, um, it changes depending on the project. And some of our future projects, it's even a, it's even a different um, role. A lot more production on some of our future projects. Interesting. And um, forgive me for throwing it at you, but you also have made a few games yourself along the way. Didn't um, Waypoint just write about you? Um, <laughs> some narrative um, game that you guys did about dating? Okay, yeah. So that was actually... Uh, I've only been involved with one Game Jam game in my life. I, <laughs> I'm I giving never... you credit for every single hat that you wear because it kind of blows my mind. But yeah, this this is kind of an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, we attended Train Jam last year as mentors. Um, and awesome. that's like the Game Jam that you get on a train in Chicago, you get off in um, basically San Fran um, right before GDC. Um, and they have this really cool like university student initiative where they bring out a bunch of uni students, they have a bunch of mentors and experts on the train, and then we sort of take hours and we sort of hold office hours, look at resumes, we talk about the game industry, we help them with their games, we play test things. But it's on this train and there's only game developers on this train, like 300 plus game developers. <laughs> um, 
So we had just launched Night in the Woods and Andrew Schuldice from Tunic was on the train and Ed and I were super tired and we're like, you know, it's a game jam, like let's build something. And I'm like, well, I'm useless. Um, <laughs> I really can't do anything. Like I can't program, I can't do art, I can't code, like I can't um, do sound. I mean, I could probably, if somebody else, I could jump up and down and make sound, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, if somebody else did the recording and editing on it, um, I was like, all I can do is write. Like that's that's the only skill that I have because that's what I did before I was in games. Like I worked, I, we were talking about it earlier, but um, I worked in PR and marketing. Like I did media relations. So like I did press Can releases. relate, yep. <laughs> yep. And my hobby since I was a kid has been just writing sort of short fiction and weirdly narrative poetry. Um, cool. That is a super nerdy thing to do when you're <laughs> a fourth grader, but that's when it started. Um, so I was like, man, like all I can do is write. I'm like, but Adam and I have been talking about this um, weird like how do you procedurally tell a story out of order kind of and um so we took this so i wrote the same story three different times from three different perspectives but it was of a first date of a couple of teenage kids oh cool and it kind of doesn't end particularly well but like in a very charming way but then it tells a story out of order from the three different perspectives based on like what uh word in the sentences you click on oh. and it follows the word path down cool and then Andrew did a, just like a setting sun 3D thing with like <laughs> pinks and oranges and purples. So you're just like watching this scene of like the sun setting over like water and cliffs mm-hmm. while you're learning about the story, which inevitably involves vomit. Oh. Um, <laughs> the first date. Uh, That's really cute. And this was all done on the train? Like on the yeah. way to GDC? I think it took us cool. like collectively, I don't know, four and a half hours. And most of that was me writing. Interesting. Um, but we were doing, um, so we had all these mentorship hours, but we were also running all of our like launch support on the train because we seriously, we launched Night in the Woods on that <laughs> Tuesday. We got on the train Thursday at like 12. So we were like, the, the support emails come wild. through Adam's email <laughs> account. <laughs> what so, were you thinking? I mean, I mean, why? I know what you were thinking. You were trying to be like amazing, well, we were, but <laughs> we were supposed to launch in February. Oh, okay. We were supposed to launch right before GDC, so we so just happened. To... Yeah, yeah. Wow. We had to delay our launch from January to February. I think it was supposed to be February or January 10th or something. I don't know. We were running a bit behind, mm-hmm. as one does when you're making a giant game. Um, no joke. And yeah, so we had to launch and then we seriously got out. We launched on Tuesday. We got on a plane on Wednesday to Chicago, got on a train on Thursday, and we were practically off grid until Saturday (laughs) while running launch support. I don't recommend this. We are so dumb. I mean, (laughs) it speaks to your marriage. Um, Crazy. (laughs) That's that's also having kids and dogs. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got no. You've already convinced me that you're superheroes, um, but this is just kind of like adding to the mystique. Um, it's it's really impressive to me that you guys would not. Um, I don't want to say impressive, maybe that's the wrong word, but I really admire the fact that you would not, you know, turn down one of those commitments, especially given that you know one of them was a jam, although it is a really cool jam, and one of them involves students, although it's a really amazing opportunity for students that you wouldn't want to let them down either. Oh. Um, that's really funny. impressive, you know? Sort of like rolling into it, we're like, well, I mean, we weren't solo completely. Like we had, like Chris Dwyer was helping run a whole bunch of stuff. Like Scott and Bethany were running the Kickstarter. Like Alec was technically still available. Like mm-hmm. he was not on the train. So we did have people from the team not on the train. Right. And every time the internet, Adam just started blazing through his email support. Um, I mean, that said, like, we had a lot of external support. Like my mom was in town helping watch our kids. And, That's cool. Um, but like you sort of get into it and you're just like, well, this is going to be a hell of a roller coaster. We got, I don't know, what, three weeks between launch and the end of PAX East. Mm-hmm. We can do this. I mean, <laughs> maybe. I mean, you may not have had a choice, but it is impressive, especially knowing this now, um, to see how everything worked out. Um, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure you're like, yeah, sure, great, no problem. But at the time, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it was really difficult. Um, it was crazy. It's really cool then that, that this train jam game is getting some recognition. I, I totally stumbled upon that this morning and forgot to mention it to you, um, but I downloaded it, so I'm going to check it out tonight. That's really oh, cute. Um, well, it was really surprising fun. when it came out at the end there's so many smart people on the train. And our, our Game Jam Jam was so tiny and so short and so silly. And it was just sort of <laughs> testing this, like, narrative thing that Adam and I had been talking yeah. about on road trips. Um, and just hadn't had time to build. 
Um, and then it ended up in a, like a bunch of like, here's like the top five fun things I did. And I was just like, really? Like my date barfing huh. story. I mean, it's a charming story about a couple of kids on a date, but it's like really weird. <laughs> well, I love when games sort of resonate with people for reasons that don't necessarily make a lot of sense or that are very personal that you don't necessarily understand from the outset. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that that's one of those. Um, I guess I, I am kind of interested in given that you, you wear all these different hats, um, is there a certain part of your job that you think is like the best part or the worst part or the weirdest part? Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's lots of things that you don't love to do, but um, there's got to be something that just sort of makes you want to keep going every day too. <laughs> so I like working with really smart, talented people. Um, I like helping people make beautiful things. Um, and nice. oftentimes that doesn't overlap with being able to wrangle bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. um, and I am exceptionally good at wrangling bureaucracy. Um, <laughs> and mostly because like, I, I get it. I understand why that like bureaucracy and giant corporations make the decisions that they do. And I can sort of operate well within those guidelines mm -hmm. um, or those restrictions. Like I, I understand the box that they're in. Um, and that doesn't mean the box can't be opened and like, Hello, how are you doing in there? And you're like, <laughs> conglomerate, whatever. But like, you know, I'm, I'm good at it. I like making friends with people. And like, um, in a way, it's like, how do I ensure that somebody answers my email? That's mm -hmm. I spend a lot of my days, like, people need to answer my email. And like, how can we come? How can I ensure that we have like the same goal or our uh, goals are moving towards like the same, like mutually um, acceptable outcome. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Can see that you used to work in PR. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but oh, but it's it's uh I mean it's a skill that a lot of people don't um and we talked about this a little bit earlier but it's a lot of people uh, don't rec recognize the value of that skill in the industry as far as how much of a role it plays sometimes in getting a game out there. Um, oh for sure. Or if there was no me getting it attention. <laughs> yeah. Oh um, man. <laughs> well, and I bad. guess. It's the kind of thing where a lot of people don't necessarily aspire to do that part of game development. But um, again, it's so critical and it, and it becomes such a, a crucial and, and elementary component of the game's success or of a studio's success that, you know, you're you're sort of becoming more and more valued. Is this where you saw yourself when you were younger? Um, I mean, oh I know you no. started in PR marketing was um, not, never... not entertainment games, nothing like that. No. <laughs> No, uh, the closest thing is entertainment, but okay. more on like a like PR side, but not entertainment PR, more like news or oh, journalism okay. PR um, or working at a large company and running like their like actually. So my interest in PR was in medical public relations. Interesting. I wanted to work for a research institution and run their like PR and marketing department. Mm, interesting. Uh, I I super nerdy. Um, I really like medical journals. Like I, sometimes I rabbit hole on things for a while. Like mm -hmm. um, part of this is cause I started out wanting to be a doctor. Interesting. Like that's, I went to university of Michigan and that's what I'd planned on doing. And if I didn't end up in orthopedics, I was going to do, um, research on the way bones and muscles use and or work, um, after overuse in juvenile, um, athletics specifically. That's very so, like, specific. So you must have gone quite a ways well, down that academic oh, path. Yeah. A ways. I was like a junior when I switched over and, um, in, in true to form Becca, whatever, I actually ended up failing a bunch of classes, not because I'm an idiot. That's a whole other story with that. But, um, <laughs> I stupidly, so I put myself through school and I went to the university of Michigan, but I had, I worked like 30 hours a week at the Olive Garden as a Ooh. server. But I also job. thought it'd be a good idea to take on head coaching at a local high school for cheerleading. Oh. Which so you've always like been <laughs> an incredible amount of time. So an I'm working. <laughs> yeah. So I took a full like pre med course load. Uh, I was a varsity head coach at a high school. I was working thirty hours at the Olive Garden, and I was on the novice crew team at University of Michigan, like rowing. Which. <laughs> Okay, and I, I know someone who went to University of Michigan. They take the rowing seriously. It's not a joke. Um, yeah, I think even the novice. The, yeah, even the novice. So, the, it's like, yeah, it's a it's a serious commitment. So, yeah. so yeah. that obviously I didn't failed. allow you to do well in school. I you, failed a few yeah. classes. 
Um, yeah. The funny thing is, though, the classes I failed um, were half in the med school and they were curved and they were half med school uh, okay. students that That's didn't have tough. the proper. Yeah. When I showed up for the first day for my like anatomy class, my physiology class um, and my, my movement science was technically in um, the kinesiology department. But right. like at anatomy and physiology, they were like the other kids in the class were like kids, adults. Uh, how, how many times have you taken the course? And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? This is my first time. I'm like, this is my fourth. And I was oh like, my wait, it's your fourth time? Like, how is it impossible? I'm like, well, it's curved. And all the med school students who have taken gross anatomy, they get A's. Oh, that's tough. So all of us yeah. fail at like 70% the first time. And then we just have to average our grades together until we can get our C plus average. And I'm like, it was like eh. seven or eight credits of classes. And I'm like, oh, shit. Sucks. But yeah, I, I yeah. failed. I failed two classes with passing grades. Ugh, that's really frustrating. Upset. And I then mean, I went back to communications. I was like, to hell with this. I don't have. <laughs> I don't have like another seven years to like finish this. That's very so. true. Or however many dollars. I mean, you said oh you're gosh, putting yourself through school. school. That's no joke. Yeah. Um, at University of Michigan, at that point, it was like the second most expensive public university in the country. Mm -hmm. It's still probably the second most expensive. It's just way <laughs> more expensive. It's not cheap. Um, and, and again, when you're doing it on your own, it's not just like the money. It's the motivation. It's the time, energy, everything. Like, oof, yeah, that's well, tough. I was, it was, I don't know. I'm in games now because I'm not a doctor. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, it was I, a step along the path to becoming, yeah. yeah, what you are now. So communications attracted you because it was sort of what you wanted to do in medicine, just m more in well, a more general field? Yeah, kind of. I'm good at it. Um, I was always good at it. Even in high school, I was good at it. Like, it doesn't take much for me to write well mm -hmm. or talk well, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like, I was like, oh, this is natural. Like, I could, my exact thought when I was like 20 or whatever was, I could four point this <laughs> and get my grade, my GPA high enough that if I wanted a good graduate school, I could. Yes. After Which, failing a bunch at of At that courses. point, at that point is a very logical decision, right? Yep. You know, it's like I had this much money, this much time. Um, How and fast I, can I do yeah. this? And I, I yeah. hear that from a lot of communications people. They're like, it felt natural. And, you know, when it feels natural, you can take the time to hone your skill rather than learn your mm -hmm. skill. Right. Interesting. Yep. But yeah, so, I eventually fell into after or when I got my real job, I taught myself tech writing at a company. Um, like technical, like I wrote manuals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then I, from there, after I learned everything about the software at this particular software company, I became a product manager. Oh, cool. Uh, and then I quit that job and went full time with um, kind of helping Adam out. At that point, we ran a couple different companies. Finji didn't exist in its current form. Oh, okay. um, and I took over sort of the finances, mostly just the finances for a long time. Um, <laughs> and right around 2012 is when I started doing design work, but I didn't realize it. Um, and then I started taking over sort of more of the business stuff. Interesting. Um, so you sort of learned as, as you went, I guess, when it came to games and, and how, mm -hmm. how to apply yourself to that industry. Was that something that you enjoyed doing or did, was that difficult for you having come out of sort of an academic, maybe more traditional format? Um, it was super easy. It was kind of like this needed to be done and I had time, mm -hmm. but it was all really easy stuff. I mean, it's all business. Mm -hmm, like. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Excel spreadsheets and sending <laughs> emails and stuff. It's um, funny how often Excel gets mentioned when, <laughs> when I'm talking to the business end of games. But this is this I is the nitty gritty. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the nitty gritty exactly. Um, so you mentioned sort of basically leaving your career path to help Adam. Was the intention then to sort of eventually work together and have your own company and you no. know do that? <laughs> I was looking at, at that time. I was like, well, maybe I want to be a nurse. I don't wow. know, maybe a school teacher. I was like, I didn't know what I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Like, I wasn't super, like, I worked in nonprofit PR for a long time, and I was really not happy in the nonprofit um, arena. I had zero interest in moving into, like, advertising mm. um, or any of those hours. Like, that just wasn't my jam. Um, because in order to get the kind of position I wanted, I would have had to, like, grunt work for a long time and I was yeah. like man I'm way too executive at this point to be grunt working through advertising yeah uh, and because I'd never really worked in technic in technology um, at the software company with um, like the marketing team that much I was mm -hmm. always on the development side 
Okay. But then I'm like, crap, like I've, I don't have an engineering background, so I'm never going to get another product manager position. And I wanted to leave the company I was at because I wasn't super happy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Adam had taken on an advertising project and we had launched Wordle, sort of our first iOS game. And he had just bought me months kind of to job hunt, mm-hmm. which was awesome. Um, and then like the recession hit. But then he put out Cannibal and bought me a bunch more months. And by the time I realized it, it was like 2010. I was just like, I haven't had a real job in two years. <laughs> like, but we'd, we continued to keep, we refer to this, like we buy months. Mm-hmm. Like well, we by working again. and releasing games. Exactly. But yeah. <laughs> With a contract, we buy X, X many months of burn rate or whatever. So nice. we had managed to like buy ourselves like a sustainable burn rate. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, that was Adam like Adam quit his job back in 2006 and I worked for three years Mm -hmm. supporting him while he sort of like build up a consulting indie thing. Yeah. So So, this is kind of the other way around now your turn. Yeah. 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 Um, But yeah, we were like, there were so many, so many things I could have done. Mm -hmm. And there was all this like um, kind of grunt work to running, running the iOS company and our advertising like turnkey thing Mm -hmm. that like, by the time sort of 2013 came around, we were looking at rebranding and everything and was just like, Hey, so you're kind of running this stuff anyways. Do you want to run this for reals? Like, it's only <laughs> ever going to as well. <laughs> He's like, you're going to have to put a picture of you on the internet. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know about that. <laughs> hmm. Deal breaker. <laughs> well, rubbed my image from the internet just <laughs> because Trolls will be trolls. It's fair. Um, but I am glad that, you know, you, he convinced you somehow <laughs> yeah. to do it. Um, I mean, you, you've sort of become a really, I think, a, a very positive public image in games. But as I said, not not sort of the traditional end of games either. Adam's sort of more of the traditional, I guess, dev designer mm-hmm. guy. And then you've got sort of this business savvy. Um, so Finji, to me, seems like a very natural marriage of the two, um, given mm-hmm. sort of your relationship. But was that sort of like a scary jump for you guys to make? Um, was that, um, you know, did it feel natural? <laughs> it did. So Adam and I, I mean, so even when Adam had a real job, he worked at the same company I worked at. We've known each other since oh, we were 16. Oh, I didn't know so that. He was 16, I was 17. That's so like cute. When, <laughs> yeah. When Adam got his first, like, real programming job, I got a job at the same company after him. And it was a smallish company. There were only, like, 20 people in it. So, I mean, we saw each other all the time. Um, and we worked at that company until he quit. Um, and then when I quit, we were just in the house together, like, and we've been together so long that like, what better way to spend a life than like hanging out with like your bestie every day, creating Um, stuff, awesome stuff. (laughs) And we're just not, um, we have a lot, I have several friends who, uh, cannot live without bickering with their partner. Mm. It's like, that's just their personalities. They bicker all the time, which would make me so stressed. And neither Adam or I bicker. We don't argue. We don't fight. We would rather just like, man, yeah, whatever. That makes like, for a good that's partnership. What you want, like, yeah. I can roll with that. Like, this is not, this is not the hill I'm going to die on <laughs> in this fight. Like, I just, I would rather make a decision and move on. And like, we both operate that way. Mm-hmm. So like the transition was actually really easy because we were already we had already been home together mm-hmm. for like five years. And at this point we were home together now with two kids and two dogs. And we're just like, whatever, bring on the <laughs> chaos. This is fine. Interesting. Well, I guess, you know, when your communication is already strong enough to know that you can, as you say, sort of make decisions and get over the difficulties mm-hmm. of family life. Um, I think, you know, the business, the business thing may come more, more easily. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Bickering. That's, that's an interesting point. Cause I, I know some people who've started businesses together and they tend to bicker a lot. And I question what gets done there. Um, Cause you know, being a husband and wife team, I'm sure you guys often well, are asked, you know, how, what's that like? <laughs> yeah. Well, why would you want to do that? I yeah. Just need it. Like, well, it's not for everyone. It really is not for anyone, everyone. And it's also like, there's a lot of communication to make sure that we both had equal buy-in. Ah, okay. Like it's one thing, like if, if, if I were a different human, and I knew this was something Adam wanted to do, but I was doing it for him. Mm-hmm. That's a really, really wrong reason to be doing something like this. Mm. I did this because, yeah, I'm on board. It seems really fun. And I already knew kind of everybody in the indie space anyways, because I'd been attending GDC, but as Adam's wife for a while. <laughs> yeah, let's go to San Francisco before we had kids and stuff. Like, yeah, let's go. Like, I, I'll hang out in San Fran for a week. 
You sort of done a bit I'll of be, research and I'll be nice <laughs> yeah. and listen to my friends talk. It's cool. Um, so, hmm. but I have seen, I mean, I've seen this even in partnerships with like, like brothers or siblings will like work on something together. And one is working on it because they were asked to, right. And not because they want to. Right. Um, and that's fine for like six months, 12 months. But if you're starting to roll into like three, four years, all of a sudden that's like, you've not communicated the life that you want to have. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. so like with me and Adam, we get asked all the time, how can you possibly do this? Like, well, we communicated that this is the life we want to have and we reevaluate all the time. Um, and a lot of this started out with like, I was going to have our first kid and Adam's like, well, what are you going to do when you want to go back to work? Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know. Yeah. What do I want to do when Mm -hmm. my kids are older? He's like, cause you don't want to stay home forever. He's like, I can't imagine that's something you want to do. And I was like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we started talking like, well, what if I ran this? Like, this is in my wheelhouse. Like I have, I have all the skill sets that we're looking for here that you don't want to do. And like, you're always dangerously close to burning down Mm -hmm. our relationships because you just get mad. (laughs) Well, it's just not his forte. Like you have fortes. He has fortes. Yeah. Yeah. Struggle very hard not to shout something horrible though. (laughs) He's incredibly good at it. And he's such a, he's sweet and wonderful and kind, but every once in a while, like a decision's made or he just, why? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'll take that. They're in a box. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They have certain rules in this box. Yeah, being super familiar with that. I think, as you said, too, not taking on all of that responsibility as a support role, but rather as like a, a challenge for yourself. Like, hey, I can mm-hmm. do this. I'll be good at this. Um, it is is actually really critically important. There's a lot of studios who, as you say, may need to lean on those support systems, especially initially to get a project off the ground. But in the long run, um, you know, you have to have your own vested interest. Um, yeah. In the long run, a lot of people who used to be designers and used to program something every single day turn into studio directors. Mm-hmm. Like, Just by necessity, I, can, I guess. I can think of at least four <laughs> right off the top of my head who spend most of their days doing what I'm doing now. But they started out as an artist or a programmer and they had to develop those skills later. But they developed them because they wanted to. Right. Like there was some conscious decision at some point to not hire that person and to develop them themselves. And in the case of me and Adam, like I was just sort of sitting there like, I can do that. (laughs) I already do the finances. I already do all the trademarking. I already do all the legal and contracts. Mm -hmm. If you've asked me to, I already like check out all of our marketing plans because (laughs) I edit everything. I've written all the press releases for years. Yeah. It's It's sort of already in my wheelhouse completely. Yeah. (laughs) Like I'll talk to Sony. Yeah. Like fine. And then I sweat. Yeah. Yeah, I started doing shows and now I just do all the shows. Mm-hmm. It's fine. Mm-hmm. I don't mind. I don't mind traveling because I don't have to be sitting in this particular desk coding all day long. See, and that's where you just need to make sure that you have the right people in the right place. It's not that, you know, you can't force people to do what they don't enjoy doing for a long period of time without some kind of repercussion. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's interesting that coming from such a different field that this has sort of grown on you, um, despite being, I think, a very different industry. Games is sort of a very unique beast yeah. in a sense um, i am absolutely yeah. a nerd <laughs> <laughs> that helps actually a lot um relating like, to people in this industry coming from that standpoint because i know like that's sort of my background and um that i don't know if it's humility or like like absolutely unabashed like fandom over certain things <laughs> yeah mine's super different i was adam actually called me a closet nerd when he met me oh yeah because like i mean if you saw me, if you watched me walk by, you're like, oh, hey, that's like a tall, skinny, athletic, competitive cheerleader, dancer, jock, yeah. smart girl, like <laughs> National Honor Society. Like I, I just, I did all that stuff. Yeah. But, like I also read an insane amount of like sci-fi and fantasy lit. Mm-hmm. All of it. Mm-hmm. Forever. <laughs> uh, you know, I played through Secret of Mana, like, you know, 30 times or something before I was like 17. <laughs> like my bestie and I, when we were like 15, used to go over to her house and play like, it might've been Wolfenstein 3D. I didn't even <laughs> work called on our computer while we like prank called boys, which we were still doing. We used to stay up all night long watching like all vintage horror movies. Like mm-hmm. 
the people present a certain way, but that doesn't mean that like, yeah, they're legit. They got they got some <laughs> they got some nerd in their background. I think everyone and, has nerdy tendencies if they're being honest with themselves. And oh, for sure. You might have there's to reach a certain thing. age before you're honest, but <laughs> there's always this thing where it's like, oh well, they're a jock. They can't possibly. I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, those boxes don't exist you. for people. Yes. Yeah, this is the same <laughs> box. Well, and that's kind of been the, the neat thing for me about games is that um, you meet people who come from so many different places and backgrounds. So it's not this like one very cookie cutter stereotype of like a computer developer or something like that. I don't mm-hmm. even know what that means when I say that, but whatever oh, that means. <laughs> there are indies that like used to tour with punk rock bands. That's exactly right. Or like, I've, I've met people who were bankers and lawyers. Um, mm-hmm. I've met a, a professional figure skater who also wants to make video games on the side. Like all amazing. these really cool random people. Um, so it's it's sort of easy for me to understand why once you get into it, as long as you can find your niche and find a way to sort of massage mm-hmm. your skills, you know, why, why people would want to stick around. Um, now, you've also enjoyed quite a lot of success, I think many would argue, in the industry. Has it been a... a a strange transition for you going from sort of starting up a company with your husband with obviously individual title success going to a company where you have multiple titles under your belt and you're sort of juggling them all at the same time um what's that like <laughs> uh, every once in a while I look at like there's always that thing like when you're first starting out like you need to have launched one game or two games or something like on your cv or resume or whatever mm-hmm. and every once in a while because I don't actually have a resume anymore I just don't <laughs> I, I can write it if I needed one I guess <laughs> But every once in a while, I'm just like, I've released a lot of games. Yeah. In one year. Yeah, like, like in I, a short time too. That's the important like thing here. <laughs> five or six console launches in the last year, and I'm just like, I am insane. <laughs> but like, I mean, it's it's one of those things where like I remember the first time I was recognized. Like GDC is always a weird thing for us because it's the only time of year really that like we we get off the BART in Union Station, we come up and there's that's that trolley is like right there yeah. outside of it. And there's always some game developers in that trolley line when we come in for GDC. And as Waiting we walk by, enough. well, as we walk by, like, that's, that's Adam Atomic right there. That's Adam Atomic. And like Adam that's gets great. recognized. Like, but I remember the first time that I got recognized and I was just like, this is weird. And I was like, Adam, like, is this what it's like being you at GDC? I'm like, he's like, oh, a little bit. But like when I go to, well, I get recognized a little bit more now at like PAX and stuff because I go to shows. Mm-hmm. But like our first several shows, like nobody knew who I was or nobody knew who Adam was. It was great because it's at GDC, different. it's a very different thing. We sort of get stopped a lot and not just by our friends, but like from people who like they are familiar with Flixel. They use Flixel to make their first game. Yeah. Or they saw my like shouting about being a mom in indie at like <laughs> the soapbox three years ago. And yeah. they're, st- they're like, let me tell you my, my life history, which I think is like utterly charming and super sweet, but it doesn't happen in real life. Right. Um, right. So it's always really weird. Cause I'm like, I'm just a boring, like 30 something year old mom in the Midwest. <laughs> Until who, you like, step into this red carpet. And exactly, then, yeah. Who has pink hair at kid pickup. She gets <laughs> some strange looks in the Midwest, but yeah, at like, uh, at the industry events, it's weird being recognized. Um, and for things like in my brain, I'm like, well, I didn't do anything. I mean, this is no big deal, right? I'm like, oh, it's Adam. Adam's the smart one. I mean, that's always like sort of like the track going on in my head. Like, why are these people so strange? Right, right. I'm not interesting. I'm just Becca. <laughs> and like, and that's... I guess from your perspective, what, yeah, I'm sure it's like... <laughs> imposter syndrome being human or whatever. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. It's... <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, and I think it's, it's well, it's very endearing for one, but it is, um, I think, a good lesson for people to understand that, you know, it's not, it's like celebrities or whoever it is that you're sort of fanning after. Um, they're real people yeah. and like it can be totally weird for them. And, and and I imagine there are people who you would fan crush over as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny how that cuts, like just because you enjoy that admiration doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have just as much for other people. Um, I guess I, I am interested to know if you've ever had a weird like fan encounter, like anything that was, <laughs> I don't want to call anyone yeah. out, but yeah, just anything that was like super weird or maybe notable or memorable. <laughs> um, the first time I was asked for an autograph was like super weird <laughs> because it was completely unexpected. What did they ask you to sign? 
I honestly can't even remember. I was so <laughs> okay, like, it probably wasn't too like weird then. <laughs> no, it was probably a book or something. I don't know. But I was just like, is this really happening to me? And Adam's like laughing. That's cool. Um, <laughs> no, the things that usually end up happening to me is like somebody's talking to me and like, I know that they're supposed to be famous in the game industry. Like I'm at an event mm -hmm. and it's happened a couple of times where somebody comes up and talks to me about my game and I can see a line forming behind them to get an autograph. <laughs> and I don't know who the F they are and I, I kind of like don't that. care. I know they're <laughs> way famous. They probably made something completely amazing, but like I'm, I'm, in my brain, I'm just like, I don't care, but you want to see my stuff? Cool. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like always. I mean, that's, there's so few people that like, uh, I don't know, like when you live in Austin, especially you kind of see celebrities a lot, just sort of like, that's fair. yeah. Um, and you're just like, man, they're just like normal people. And, you know, we have some friends who are related to like some pretty high profile celebrities. So sometimes they would sort of end up in like our group of friends or whatever. And, mm. and they just want to eat pizza and have a beer. <laughs> they're just and people. They, yeah. <laughs> they, they, they have hobbies and stuff. And, um, one of the, the preschool dads, um, when my son was in preschool in Austin, uh, toured in a pretty famous indie band. Um, and it was funny because for a long time, I was just like, his name sounds really familiar. Like, he must oh. be a musician, but it's Austin. And then I remember sitting down one time. We were like, um, it was like a preschool party, preschool party. We're just like, oh, well, that's who you are. Cool. Oh. <laughs> was it like tour? And like, he would just tell funny stories about like touring, but it was just like, I was a fan of his music. Mm -hmm. Still, I'm a fan of like his band's music. But I was mm -hmm. just like, man, you're just like this kid's dad. Just a normal person, just especially like, in that context, right? Once you meet them in like a more personal context, mm -hmm. it's like, oh yeah, okay, we're all human. Yeah, and but like cool. I totally understand. <laughs> like, sort of, I call them the drive-bys. I totally understand the drive-bys, and like <laughs> that drive-by matters, because like, like I remember being you know, meeting the lead singer of Goldfinger when I was like 20 or whatever at a warp tour. And I was just like, oh, hi. And it means, hi. it means something to you as a fan that maybe as a creator, you'll never truly understand, exactly. <laughs> you know? Well, it's funny because it speaks to privilege. Like in a lot of ways, like I have access where others don't. Mm -hmm. Like I can just call up this friend that I'd known before they were famous. Mm-hmm. And be like, hey, we're going to be at this thing together. Let's go get drinks. But if I mention it casually in conversation, if I'm not paying attention, they're like, how do you know that person? Yeah. Like, well, they've stayed at my house. Yeah. And I've to known you, it's no thing. Was 26 and poor. Like, <laughs> but they're like, wow. And I'm like, well, it's just, it's really funny. <laughs> like, he's just a person. But now, like, that person has to be kind of guarded because now they're super famous. And mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, it's a weird industry because when we go home, nobody knows us. Mm. And that's, what's like always really nice. Mm -hmm. Like we don't really get recognized at home for your day to day. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. to be able to pick and choose, I think when you're in that spotlight position, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I imagine you guys probably are put there a lot. Um, and that's, that yeah. might be where it's travel. Yeah. I, I guess like as long as you can control, um, how much of it is coming at you and how fast mm -hmm. <laughs> GDC is a bit of a free for all sometimes, but, uh, yeah. It's so, it, <laughs> I always brag a little bit on GDC, but that's just because our schedule is usually so legit stupid while we're there. And we don't get to hang out with our friends as much as we used to. Mm -hmm. But like GDC is actually very cool. And I do absolutely love it when strangers come up and chat with me because how am I going to make more friends? Especially <laughs> like when women come up and chat. Like when I first came to GDC, there were like the percentages, like the breakdown, demographic breakdown was so different. And now I get to like walk around GDC and there's so many more women running around. And I'm just like, I want to meet all of you. Oh, that's really cool to hear. Yeah, this we is only my second GDC. Stuff. So I, I feel like my perception is a little warped. <laughs> like, I feel like there's tons of women there, but I've also been part of groups of women who've gone. So naturally, that, yeah. that's really actually great to hear. I don't um, even think the percentages hmm. are that different. I used to actually know them, but it feels different. It feels a way more different than it used to. Well, I think having females in roles like yours or people on the floor representing games who are mm -hmm. obviously female or, or really from any sort of minority group at all mm -hmm. um, is very comforting if, as a newcomer to the scene. Um, anytime you feel like there's not sort of this like preset of conditions to succeeding in an industry, but that there's like a room for, 
you know, diverse opinions and people and thoughts, um, that, that's sort of very comforting. And it's not just as a woman, I know a lot of people who, um, you know, whether it's sort of like a gender issue or whatever, a lot of people are feeling like the games industry is trying to open up. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think well, conferences are probably the first place that's going to happen. Well, GDC is kind of cost prohibitive for a lot of people, but mm -hmm. I mean, shout outs to Megan Scavio who used to run sort of like GDC in general, like she and Simon Carlos really like heralded the code of conduct several yes. years ago. Yes. And like, I mean, massive shout outs. That was amazing. Cause like pre code of conduct GDC and post code of conduct. Cause I've been to both mm. totally different place. I had some crazy stuff happen at GDC's pre code of conduct. And like after it was just like, and I didn't even have the bat, the worst of it happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Kudos, I mean, kudos to Megan and Simon. Yeah, this is this is exactly why our industry needs people sort of like <laughs> creating codes of conduct and, and making these changes. Um, interesting. Uh, to switch gears just a little bit, um, mm -hmm. I guess we've talked a lot about the games that you're sort of working on and, and obviously sort of the fans that are, are sort of following the communities around your games. Are there any games that you personally are a fan of? And it could be sort of a past game. I mean, you mentioned a few from your past. <laughs> um, but are there any that you would consider yourself sort of like a, I don't know about a fan of the developers in a sense, but like a fan of the game itself? Anything that you really are enjoying? Um, I've got actually, I've, I have a couple. Um, so I don't actually get to play games a ton, a ton. Um, mm -hmm. I imagine. <laughs> actually, I'm, one, I'm super busy now, but part of it, like, I played games a lot until I was 14, and then I didn't pick them up again until I was like near like 28 ish. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of missed, due to my age, the majority of like move through 3D space. Right. Um, so I find moving through 3D space and camera controls incredibly frustrating with mm -hmm. nearly every single game. It's like, oh, it makes me furious. Interesting. But, uh, so I end up actually watching a lot of games with Adam. Um, I can't stand watching games on YouTube or streams. <laughs> it, I, I just can't do it. But um, if Adam's playing a game, I'm usually sitting right there with him um, watching it. And sometimes there's like two player games that we'll play together or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's funny because everyone's putting together like best of 2017 lists. And I was just like uh, writing my snarky version of this. <laughs> which is like Becca's best of 2017, which included only one game from 2017, uh, which was Night in the Woods because I had to play that like 25 times. <laughs> well, at least you're being honest. <laughs> yeah. like, best of 2017, Night in the Woods. Mm. Sorry, y'all. Sorry, guys. It's the game from 2017 I played other than Mario Kart 8. <laughs> and just Mario Kart 8 just didn't make the cut. <laughs> oh, at that point, I only played like two races because my <laughs> controllers. Oh, that's uh, funny. But yeah, no, in, in the rest of my like sort of snarky best of 2017 was uh, the game Threes, which came out, I don't know, in what, 2015 or something, like the mobile <laughs> game. Uh, oh, the mobile, okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, Asher's and Greg Wolven's Threes with like, every, they ended up becoming 2048 and like the ripoff ones, but Threes is still amazing. And like, I play a tremendous amount of Threes all the time. Uh, another best of 2017 that didn't come out in 2017 is Mini Metro. I still play that one all the oh. time. <laughs> um, and other than that, yeah, I uh, I still completely adore like Secret of Mana from like you know the 90s. It's a pretty good one, and I haven't played it in a while, and now I'm kind of like getting that nostalgic like oh I remember that oh, game. So good. Yeah, like I'm just like so getting good. like the images in my head and. I'm going to play um, it in protest when the new one comes out. <laughs> I was just about to ask you how you felt about the new one. I knew. I knew. I somehow. will probably play the new one, but I'm so pissed off about that damn tiger bikini that, like, I was like, come just on. Just weird decisions. I get it. Just weird I get decisions. It. Yeah, I'm like, I understand it's a tiger bikini, but you didn't have to do it. You could have stylized yeah. it in any other way. And as, but, you know, people making marketing decisions now and again for games, it's like, what? It's like, yeah. am I really going to have to see, like, I'm, I am. I'm going to have to see Purim in a tiger bikini and a cosplay, and I'm just, it's just going to make me sad. Oh, goodness. Not because I have any prudish thing about a bikini, but it just makes me sad because Purim's a badass. Yeah. She would wear a bikini. She has <laughs> full armor using her you know, super magic powers. <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's the like, very selective fan service that, of it yeah. that kind of irks me. Because I'm like, man, there's other fans. There's other service. 
<laughs> do other fan service. Um, but yeah. I mean, so those are some of the games. I mean, I've watched funny. obviously, I've watched a tremendous amount of um, Breath of the Wild, uh, mm-hmm. Mario Odyssey. Um, do I've, you have a Do you have a Switch in your house? Oh, totally. I assume because you have Multiple. kids. And, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have oh. one yet, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. The way I'm we got it was very there. funny, but uh, we wanted to get one. We tried to get one here in town and just couldn't. And we sort of like lamented the fact Adam did online. And I think somebody accidentally bought two, mm-hmm. like just a random internet follower of Adam's. Um, I was like, I have one with like with packaged with games, like if you would just want to buy it for me at cost, because I seriously have two of them. Adam's like, are you serious? That's so nice. Oh, so wow. yeah, we just like PayPal'd him over like the price he paid for it and he shipped it to us. Wow. Because otherwise we probably would have just gotten it like two months ago. The internet's not always a bad place, see? I know. Oh, I love that. There are, there are sweetie bears on the Twitters. Absolutely. Um, they may not be the, the loudest, but they are there. <laughs> <laughs> they are there. Um. I guess we've talked a little bit about the games that you're sort of working on in general, um, but coming up at PAX South specifically this weekend, what are what games are being shown? Is it a number of them? Is it specifically Night in yep. the Woods? Is it? I'm bringing three. So Overland is our next release. So I'm going to have okay. a bunch of stations, a bunch of seated stations with Overland because we like to encourage Overland players to like come and play together. Overland is very fun to like sit together and bicker, kind of like you would if you were playing Pandemic. Oh, nice. Okay. It's like a single player game, but um, the way people play it is really fascinating. Um, and then we also have a couple stations for Tunic. So we're going to be playing like the Tunic demo. Mm-hmm. And then we also have a couple stations of Night in the Woods running the, it runs sort of the first two days up to um, pizza eating and arm poking. <laughs> so I'm just going to say this. That's a game, pizza eating and arm poking. <laughs> when May goes to bed that night is sort of where we cut the demo cool so yeah i'll have all those i'll have some some merch got a couple t-shirts and game codes and stuff exciting um, yeah we're gonna be right next to vlambeer so like rami and adriel oh, very cool very cool adriel and she obviously runs train jam so mm-hmm. i gather you guys all know each other very well um i did want to mention real quickly um just because you mentioned that you'd have a, some merch uh night of the woods has done quite well from a merch standpoint as well is that correct i think so um yeah. scott and bethany actually run the merch store mm-hmm. um and they have awesome merch. Yeah, it's None really of awesome. I have yet. Uh, <laughs> Let's Scott, get you equipped, maybe. But well, uh, we, haven't, we haven't seen Scott yet, um, and he usually just like brings it when we see him. So next time oh, I'm going to see him is cool. GC, so he'll probably come out with like sacks because I really want my clothes. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I've seen some adorable um, sort of tie-ins to the artwork and obviously the characters, but. Um, yeah, hopefully, if you're at GDC, I will be sure to bring my crew around and we can sort of get a peek if you guys are there. Um, what else? I guess we've talked a lot about different people in the games industry you've worked with, um, and obviously, Vlambeer is sort of a great example. Um, are there any people in the industry who you consider as mentors or, I mean, heroes is maybe a oh, big call, sure. but just, just people in general who you might want to call out who you... Um, um, looked up so to? there's a couple of, there's a couple of women, actually, I look up to tremendously. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Siobhan at Media Molecule, I think is like, she's just an incredible, amazing human. Um, also like industry, just badass, like Mm -hmm. so smart. Um, I also, um, I really look up to Brenda Romero. Mm -hmm. Um, I think she's amazing. Plus she's, she's a, she's a mom. She's like working in this industry and she's like a delight. Yeah. Yeah, She's just (laughs) a delight in general. Um, and then also sort of like some, uh, some West Coasters, um, Robin um, from Phenomena, um, yeah. and then um, probably Felix Kramer uh, as well. Um, I look up to them quite a bit. Um, and as far as like guys uh, on the other side of things, mm-hmm. uh, sort of mentors or I guess studio mentors, um, Nathan Bella and Jamie Chang. So Nathan Vella runs Cappy out of Toronto oh, okay, and Jamie cool. runs Clay. Um, and both of them have been kind of around for us forever um, for any of our crazy questions that we come up with. Um, it's kind of important for everyone to have kind of that person mm-hmm. like sitting around like, hey, <laughs> help, uh, this thing just <laughs> happened and I just don't even know. I don't understand how this contract works or, mm-hmm. or, or, or and like kind of having a studio director kind of 
mentoring us has mm-hmm. been completely amazing mm-hmm. um, about even the weirdest stuff. Like, hey, there's this ad thing that I know you did. Got any info? Like, should we do it? And they know enough about my company that they can be like, yeah, that'd be great. Or no, that'd be terrible. Or mm-hmm. yeah, it's been pretty great. Um, it's a great industry that way, too. I find people are very um, sort of generous with their their yes. advice and their recommendations. Um, I mean, your your company is sort of like in and of that um, in and of itself because yeah, you're trying to help others. But but, you know, even just a phone call so away. many people as well. Like, I mean, it's kind of like if if you have the time and the inclination, um, always try to give back mm-hmm. um, as much as possible. Mm-hmm. So it's nice. Yeah. And it's something that I think a lot of people, um, that sort of attitude has been adopted in the industry. It's like Mm -hmm. something that a lot of people share, which is great. Um, I'd be interested to know if you've seen, we talked a little about the changes in GDC and sort of representation. Um, but have you seen any change in, in the games industry itself, um, over the past, I don't know, let's say five years. Um, and that could be the way the games are being made. It could be the people making them. It could be the games themselves. Uh, there's just so many of us now. Like, the first time I went to GDC, like, I could fit all the indies, like, in my dining room. <laughs> like, all of them. Like, every single one that existed. Um, and now there's so many that I can't even keep track of everybody. Interesting. Um, um, but just in, like, the last five years, like, the... it As games get quote-unquote quote unquote, easier to make, which mm-hmm. that's... A, pile of garbage <laughs> the tools you can actually use so you don't have to build an engine from scratch but apparently that makes them easy hmm. no no <laughs> oh my heavens no um like as the tools get easier to make so the barrier to entry is less it means there's just more people in the space mm-hmm. um which means that people who are coming into the industry sort of like with a gold rush mentality mm. are kind of putting too much on the line, too much at risk, um, and having unrealistic expectations. Um, like to, we are indie because we took like a decade to Mm -hmm. be indie. Like Mm -hmm. I had a job while Adam like quit and like build up, built up clients and we got lucky with one thing and then we got lucky again. Yes. It was the right thing at the right time, but you don't, you don't control what's the right thing and you don't control time. So you kind of like gaze into your crystal ball and hope. Um, there's a version of Night in the Woods that burns up. There's a version of Cannabalt like six months later, and it was the second one button runner, like auto runner on a genre. Like, and it, like there's, you don't have a lot of control over the, the what's gonna hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I worry a lot, um, specifically because I worry a lot about um, sort of the health and happiness of people, but also the sustainability of people, Like, and that includes within my own company. So if we find trends in our company that we find are not sustainable, we fix them to make sure that we can be sustainable, even if that means we have to change the type of thing we're making. Mm-hmm. Um, like we, we cancel project, projects, like, will throw away 10 months of work just because it's wrong and we right. realize it's wrong. Um, and I worry about that now because I see a lot of projects that are continuing. Um, mm-hmm. And if they were in my studio, I would have canceled them. Right. Um, right. And not because they're bad, but because they're not going to hit. Um, and the not hitting may do more damage because the pers- there is a human at the other end of that not hitting mm-hmm. um, that has to sort of climb out of it um, right. or climb out of the debt um, or the hole that's sort of left behind. And that's the part that worries me because the tools are easier to use, more people are trying to do it professionally. Mm-hmm. Um, and in order to be professionally indie, you need to like cross your, cross your T's and dot your I's and have like a bucket of backup plans in Mm -hmm. place to make sure that at the other end of it, you're still able to afford rent, um, that your family still tolerates your butt, that you didn't destroy relationships, that you didn't ruin friendships, all of these things, which we've done. Like Mm -hmm. we, we have ruined friendships. We have been through legal battles. We have done a lot of 
really just tremendously stupid and annoying and awful things over the last like 12 years or whatever it is that we've Mm -hmm. been doing this. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, we're super stable now, but that doesn't mean that we were always super stable. Right. Uh, But we had backup plans and like a bucket of options. Um, So that's what, that's the part that worries me. um, And what I see now is there's so much cool stuff being made but there's so many people making it, but the way that they're making it scares me for them. Mm-hmm. Cause it's not going to, it's not going to affect me, but I worry, <laughs> I worry about people all the time. I worry about my friends. I worry mm-hmm. about like people's health um, and mm-hmm. stability. And um, I want people to make things, but I want them to make them responsibly. Right. Right. Well, and that's part of what makes you so good. I'm sure at, at your job is having the, knowledge um, and maybe foresight to be able to make some of those tough decisions um, and make sure things work out in the end. (laughs) I always look at everything like I have to have a house and I have to feed my children and someday they're probably going to go to college. Probably. (laughs) And like someday Adam and I (laughs) And there might be emergencies. (laughs) Yeah, I I pay off my house. Like we might retire someday. Like I have to buy health insurance. Like there's all these things (laughs) when you're an adult. You're just like, this has to be a part of it. Um, So how can we do this the safest way possible? And I want everyone else to do it the safest way possible, which might mean you get a real job Mm -hmm. and you work on stuff part time, which we did for years. Mm -hmm. And like, and that sucks. Like, not going (laughs) to lie. Like, if you're not doing the thing that you love most in the world during the day, it's hard. But you have to like sort of build it up to be able to do the thing that you love the most. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's entirely possible you might not be good at it. Mm-hmm. It might be a hobbyist. Like you might, like it's, that's legit. Like I like to write novels that I never finish, <laughs> but I don't do it for my day job. Yeah. Passion doesn't always equal career. Exactly. <laughs> yes. And that's, that's a sad, harsh truth. I, I do feel though that, um, well, <laughs> getting some reality checks from the industry, but also <laughs> having people in the industry like yourself who've, who've maybe been through those reality checks and can position people better as they enter the industry. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think that's where I see the hope uh, for games. Um, and the fact that people like yourself have sort of thought about this for the past few years um, is helping to future proof, I think, a lot of the roles that people are stepping into. Um, and I'm not necessarily talking about people starting their own studios. That's always going to have inherent risk. Oh, and, 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 oh, and, you know, it's terrifying. Oh, it's so terrifying. It's it's something that people are going to keep doing, I'm sure, as well, like putting their livelihood on the line. But it's, it is nice to see that the industry is sort of taking itself seriously. And I, I do mean the independent industry specifically, mm-hmm. um, that it's taking itself seriously enough to to, to, yeah, to make sure that it can survive and thrive and grow. Um, and I, I do credit people like yourself um, for, as I said, sort of keeping the reality checks there, but but also <laughs> providing, I think, the mentorship and, and guidance along the way. Um, yeah. Yeah. I always joke, like, I'm such a Debbie Downer on so many things. Like, <laughs> like I'm so sorry. It can like, feel like, that way, but, I'm like know. the worst. I'm like, but at the same time, like, when I see a risk worth taking, a terrifying risk, I'm like, dude, jump. I was going to say Just the strength of now. that, that caution can be yes. equally magnified as ambition. Exactly. Yes, I totally agree. <laughs> um, and I think that, that the projects that I see coming out from Finji kind of reflect that. Um, I mean, they're not all like crazy off the wall games that like VR for something crazy like that, but, um, but they all have something unique about them. And I think that you're trying um, to present some, uh, some variety as well in what Finji's putting out. So Night in the Woods mm-hmm. is not Tunic. That's very clear to me. Um, and although no. I, I actually, <laughs> I'm actually kind of curious to check out Overland now. Um, I have seen a, a, I guess not a demo, probably the trailer for it. I, I was going to say I wasn't familiar with it, but the art is actually very distinctive. And I was like, oh yes, it's all stretched over the place. tall pixels. Yes. Yeah. And very if you cool. if you're on, um, if you watch Twitch streams or like we kind of are all over the place because we're in like this alpha and have been. So you're mm. to- people are totally allowed to stream it if they want to because we're oh, updating nice. it all the time. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, we've been we actually just got our 5000th player last week or whatever, which is very fun. Oh, um, that's exciting. Did like a little graphic for it or whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, we just run this thing over on itch.io. So we're not in like Steam early access or whatever. And mm-hmm. it's over on itch to sort of self-select for people who have to have this right now. Nice. Uh, which helps us um, manage expectations of our players, mm-hmm. which is really fun. Um, but yeah, that's our next one out. So we're like, like bulldozing towards launch right now, um, which will take a while, but 
feels longer than it actually is. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sure the time will fly. <laughs> I was like, it's actually, yeah. It's, since I'm like within like, you know, five weeks of completely wrapping up Night in the Woods, um, Overland's wow. next and then Tunic will be rolling out after that. Wow. So Night in the Woods um, obviously is, is sort of a, I guess, a flagship um, for Finji, you can call it that. Um, yeah. Um, it's the, the one that we knew, like the team didn't think that it was going to catch on like it did, but mm -hmm. like I did. And mm -hmm. I'm the one who's been like sort of shouting about it forever. Like you guys, <laughs> you guys are gonna be fine. I know what this is going to do. Like I, I can, I see the people and the way they respond to it. So mm -hmm. for like sort of console, whatever. Yeah. Flagship, um, uh, in sort of like the PC console space, mm -hmm. um, kind of our mobile one is Cannavault. Um, it's the most well-known. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but for, very well, that's, yeah. that's our publishing, but like Overland is our flagship internal. Gotcha. Okay, cool. And I yeah, guess that'll be, building. that'll be interesting to see how Finji grows in the future, how much more um, <laughs> sort of <laughs> inside games you're going to do versus um, publishing. So I have a feeling, uh, you know, given given your success rate, you're going to be approached by a lot of people. Um, I guess that's sort of a question I didn't ask, but should, if someone did want to work with Finji, is there, is there a way for them to do that? Or do you kind of come to projects that um, you're interested in? Usually since it's just, it's, since it's just me and Adam, we generally only want one run one partner project at a time because of the way that we do our co-development. Mm -hmm. um, and like, so we have Tunic, but we also have one game after Tunic that's like unannounced right now. Um, mm -hmm. That's really early, early in development that we're 99% sure going to be working with. Okay. Um, but I don't have a time limit on that. But usually like we sort of look at when our things are being released. Right. And um, I want something that is proven that it works. Mm -hmm. um, but um, still has like 18 months left on it. I don't want something that's like, I have a done game. Here you go. Uh, Cause I can't do anything with that. Right. Right. Um, I can't, I can't drum up interest with that. Like we're little, I take these things to shows. I demo these games myself in right. a booth talking to people. Like, um, and the other thing is like Adam and I have to be tremendously excited about it. So like Tunic used to be called secret legend and like uh, Andrew showed us that game back in like 2015 or something at GDC when mm -hmm. we didn't even know who he was. And we sort of like brushed him off, oh. <laughs> but he contacted us again after GDC and we've sort of been like lightly mentoring him since. Okay, cool. Um, and it was at train gems last year when we were sort of talking to him and getting caught up, um, in sort mm -hmm. of on train jam. Um, mm -hmm. when Adam and I came away from the talk, like, I think, I think Dicey needs us. Mm -hmm. Like we've been telling him for years. He really didn't. But I think we're at a point where like the game is too big and he's unable to see the right way forward, which right. means he needs someone just sort of hold that game in their head with him. Mm -hmm. Because Dicey, I mean, he's the programmer, artist, animator, and game designer on that thing. I mean, the he's whole got project. Yeah. <laughs> he's, basically, he's got everything but sound and, and okay. um, but it, everything but sound actually. That's a lot Dicey. to have on his shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a very big game. So <laughs> Um, it was very obvious coming out of that meeting. It was just like, well, okay, so we just need to pros and cons and pitch our involvement with mm -hmm. them because everybody else is obviously probably pitching him as well. Mm -hmm. uh, just to see like what he needed. Cause like what we bring to the table is like design. We can work on your game, mm -hmm. like actually work on the game. Like we can open the unity file. <laughs> like and actually work, work with game. you. Yeah. <laughs> we can do art for your game. We can fix textures and animation, whatever, we can do all of that. So that's the type of project um, we would want to work with. We've had tremendously successful, successful projects that have um, launched already that approached us. Mm -hmm. um, and we turned them down, even though we knew it was going to do like, you know, millions of dollars, mm -hmm. because they didn't need us. Interesting. Like, there was no, they didn't need to pay us our percentage to do this thing, they could do it by themselves. They and they did mm -hmm. go on and do it by themselves. So yeah, we work with things that we're super excited about um, that a absolutely does need something that we can offer mm -hmm. um, and that has some ramp up. Awesome. Um, so. 
That's nice. It's yeah. nice to hear that like you're se <laughs> you're selective, um, but also not just for sort of your own benefit. Um, I think yeah. that it, it again sort of benefits the entire industry to see people um, working together well, when there's the right need and the right fit. We're an indie developer first. Like we're a development studio, we make games. Um, we fell into publishing because <laughs> like so many indies collaborate and they don't have anyone who the hell is going to sign a PlayStation contract Yeah. when yeah. you're in two different countries and you don't want to work on another game together. Yeah. You're just making one thing. Who's going to pay revenue share forever? Who's going to um, handle the porting studio? Like who's going to do all of this? And um, Adam and I already have to. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and if the game also has this other need that, and we want to work on it, then yeah, we will. Um, it's definitely super interesting to us. We have this version of Finji that like gets bigger. Um, but it means that we would ha like, what makes this unusual is we have Adam. So <laughs> I would need to find more Adams. Like right. I would need to find <laughs> more people who could come in on a project and be that extra designer that could pop in and mentor a project from start to finish almost outside even of a producer role mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so scalability is tough when you're dealing with such yeah. well-honed talent i i hear that um but it is i think again a fascinating business model um i i'm really excited that this kind of thing there's a lot of incubators and, and sort of mentorship sort of side studios that exist um but finji sort of a very complete package because you guys really do do it all and understand it all i imagine that a lot of what you learn from taking these games to shows and everything else also can educate, you know, the next steps mm -hmm. for the next game. Um, again, well, putting my marketing like, hat on, but yeah, yeah. it's, uh, it's <laughs> there's a lot of not data. not really like altruistic either, like putting Overland, which is where I'm going to make the majority of our income mm -hmm. for the next several years, putting that next to Night in the Woods and putting that next to Tunic absolutely is cross pollen. Sorry. Oh yep. my God. It's cross pollinating <laughs> in, in like a, an audience base. Absolutely. Yeah. I want all the people from Night in the Woods to play Tunic and they'll like it. Mm. And I want both of those people to take their friends and sit on a couch and shout at each other while on this weird, super fun, like post-apocalyptic road trip across the United States. Right. Because it's beautiful in the same ways that all of our other games are beautiful. It just mm -hmm. doesn't have like, you know, sarcastic May or this adorable little <laughs> fox running around. But it, it has sort of the same um, joyful emotions Right. Like as you play. Right. And I think that you'll build a, a really nice reputation for the games under your belt that way. Um, yeah. I think community transference is something that is difficult to do, but if you could do it well, um, everybody tends to love you. Um, very cool. Uh, I know that this has been a bit of a long interview. I really appreciate <laughs> you spending the time with me today, Becca. Um, I guess uh, on just a final note, I know that you mentioned you're going to be at PAX South. Um, obviously, there's sort of GDC coming up. Um, we'll come back and circle back with any events that uh, that people can come and check out these games um, on the floor for um, and obviously post the link so that they can find the maps or wherever it is that you're going to be. Mm -hmm. um, I know that it can get a little bit crazy, but we'll make sure that you guys can find Finji um, so that you can try out some of these titles. Um, I guess on a very, very final note, I would ask, uh, you gave a lot of good advice to people who are up and coming in the industry. Um, and I would just wonder if there's someone who like yourself is maybe um, in PR marketing, maybe medicine, I don't know. Someone who's maybe in another field thinking of making that jump into games. Is there any um, just quick advice that you might give to someone um, who like yourself, you know, 10 or whatever years ago had not considered games as an industry, but maybe maybe should think about it? Yeah, like the biggest thing that's helped me is um, if you look at all careers, there's a baseline of like, this is a job and here are the skills that I have at this job. And I got really good at this one, right? Like I can do everything at this particular job and understanding that like working in games is exactly the same. Like, um, it's, it's just, a, it's just a set of skills. It just from the outside looks to our families, like we're playing games all day. <laughs> but like when you're actually working in games, you're doing very similar things to what you're doing at like your office job or in PR and marketing, or I don't know, you're a barista. Like it, there you're just you're just learning new things and don't be afraid to um try them you might suck you might fail <laughs> um but like the easiest way to sort of like vet that without too much risk to your financial future <laughs> is to um be a part of a small project mm -hmm. like um 
you know, you can join like a tiny, I have mixed feelings about game jams, um, depend partly because of crunch culture or right. whatever. Yeah. Um, a good way to vet whether you like making games is mm-hmm. to find a couple of people to make a game with. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I wouldn't get used to doing jams all the time, mm-hmm. but do a jam. And if you are not someone who can like button seat sort of thing, like you absolutely can do a small production thing mm-hmm. with a game. Like that could be your game jam. Absolutely. It's just producing a game. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Don't be afraid of people who have, like, been in the industry forever. You're kind of always going to feel like an imposter, like you don't <laughs> quite belong. Um, and you just need to, like, shout that down in your head. Like, that's insane. We have done so many amazing things. Like, I'm here. Like, I have done design work on games. I am a game developer. I just also happen to – I can't talk about 99% of what I do every day because it's behind an NDA. <laughs> exactly. Like, but, like – I came from PR and marketing and like, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a programmer. I'm not an artist. I'm not a sound designer, but I design, I've done design work on multiple games now. And it's like, like you can be good at that. Like that's, that's a totally valid, it's a totally valid thing to do and to try it now as a hobby. Yes. Good advice. I mean, that validation is not going to come easily or quickly. So start now. (laughs) Right. Um, totally. Thank you so much, Becca. This has been really, uh, really insightful. Um, I'm so glad that we were able to hook up this interview. Um, I will make sure to circle back and get any dates where, um, again, people can come and check out some of these games. Um, Overland, Tunic, Night in the Woods, obviously, uh, something that I'm right in the middle of playing right now. So <laughs> I'm sort of like resisting my urge to fan out a little bit, but I'm, I'm having a really good time with it. Um, it's totally adorable. Um, if you guys haven't checked it out, please do. Uh, in the meantime, we will have this full interview up on uh, youtube.com slash gamedevcafe. You can also find uh, all of the notes from our interviews at gamedevcafe.com. My name is Karina. Thank you so much for joining us. Becca, thanks again for your time. Uh, we will see you next time. Bye, Thank guys. You.